Our speaker today is Dr. Yuan Chen. Yuan is currently a principal scientist at the DMPK department at Genentech. And you can see her there now. She's, she'll be on for the, for the introduction. So welcome, Yuan. And then she'll, she'll turn it off for her presentation. She has more than 20 years of experience in drug discovery and development. And she's an expert in physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling at Genentech. She's also an active member of the IQ PBPK expert working group. Next slide, please. Today's presentation is Solving a Mystery Using PBPK, How it, Drug Excipient Complexes Can Confound a Metabolic DDI Result. Yuan, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to her to begin the presentation. Thank you, Susanna. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'd like to first uh, uh, thank uh, the uh, organizer invite me to share our work using PBPK modeling approach to solve a mystery that uh, we encountered in the clinical DDI study. Um, I did hear the registration is quite overwhelming. I appreciate everyone's interest and hope you find this seminar is uh, uh, useful. So with the limited time of the seminar, you may not be able to uh, get all the details from this entire study that you would be interested. Uh, however, good things is that we do have two publications that are related to this topic already in the public. Uh, one of that covers the excipient drug complexation mechanism that led by my colleague, Matthew Dirk and uh, Paul Chen Chao. The other one basically uh, related to this, today's topic covered how we use the PPK modeling to parse this uh, confounding clinical DDI data. So um, I believe that uh, after this seminar, you can uh, have a chance to read those papers. So you'll be able to find more technical detail. So anyway, in this uh, entire work, uh, we try to gain more scientific understanding that related to these uh, three questions. Well, first is uh, how could uh, a acceptance effect on absorption confound the clinical uh, DDI data? Second is uh, how could we incorporate the drug accepting interaction into the mechanistic model to explain those uh, expected DDI study results? And ultimately, how could, without the additional uh, clinical DDI study, how could we still figure out this key uh, DDI study parameter? Therefore, we have the confidence to use this approach to inform the co-medication strategy. So if all those questions are also what you're interested uh, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to walk you through uh, to see how we solve this mystery um, by starting with uh, sharing with you the confounding uh, clinical DDI study results and what the proposed uh, the hypothesis we come up with and uh, what's the approach we took to deconvolute this confounding DDI data. Um, of course, the, uh, what would be the outcome and, and their potential impact. And at the end, I'd like to share with you our thoughts on the future uh, implementation. So phenobutinib uh, is a, a BTK inhibitor is currently under clinical development. Uh, the in vitro data showing that uh, phenobutinib is a 6 3 substrate as well as a time-dependent inhibitor. So uh, prior to the clinical DDI study, we develop a PPK model and a predict that in the presence of itraconazole, the phenobutinib, both the CMAX and AUC, were predicted to be increased in the presence of the strong inhibitor. However, from the clinical study uh, with the multiple dose treatment of itraconazole, while we do see the increase of AUC, uh, unexpectedly, we see the decrease of CMAX as well as a delay of Tmax. As shown you in this figure, the red line represents the phenobutinib 
in the presence of each color zone, the blue line is the control. So as most of you um, would know that one of the main purpose of this DDI study for a CIP3 substrate is to determine the contribution of CIP3 in their substrate drugs clearance. Certainly in this case for fenobutinib, we're facing a bigger challenge, right? How can we account for this confounding DDI study results to determine the CIP3 contribution in fenobutinib clearance? From there, we can build a confidence to predict the phenobutyl DDI with the other inhibitor. That's what we really need to know. To get there, we of course first need to be able to explain what had happened in the clinical DDI study with a, a sound scientific rationale. So to explain that, mostly, uh, especially I think, is this uh, decrease of the CMAX in the presence of each chromosome. We did consider the various possible reasons. Um, for example, how about the CYP3 gut metabolism of the phenobutinib? Could that be increased in the presence of each chromosome? And uh, this is, would be the opposite effect of each chromosome. And uh, others, such as how about the simulated phenobutinib interacting concentration in the gut, could that be the reason so that our model not be able to capture the DDI, especially decrease of the CMAX? Um, the answer is no. Also, uh, phenobutinib is a CYP3 substrate. So based on current knowledge, each chromosome could inhibit PDP, but if that did happen, inhibition of a PDP would only increase the CMAX of the phenobutinib instead of decrease. The last and very important factor would be the inhibitor etroconazole and hydroxy etroconazole concentration. Could that be a reason? So we look at the data from our own study, the concentration for the inhibitor and its metabolite uh, both have the level very similar to uh, those data has been published uh, in the uh, in uh, where is the paper? Uh, also, as you can see, the PK profile of etrocomazole and hydroxy etrocomazole, um, including the accumulation after multiple dose, are well captured in our PPK model in the DDI simulation. So all this basically indicate that none of those hypothesis-driven uh, PPK simulation could explain this observed the DDI data, especially the decrease of CMAX in the presence of each chromosome. Um, so we have to think something else, something beyond phenobutinib and each chromosome itself. So um, here is just a little bit of background information on the each chromosome. It is available in both the solution and the solid dose form in the clinic when you try to use that for DDI study. But the solution formulation, it is more commonly used because it can give higher systemic exposure and less peak variability. So in our clinical DDI study, solution formulation each console is used. So could that possible accepting in the each console solution did something uh, that resulted in this confounding DDI data? Here's our theory. So the hydroxy propyl beta sacrodextrin, it is the excipient used in the itrocondyl solution, just as it is the most commonly used excipient to improve the solubility of those insoluble drug by forming a complex between sacrodextrin and the insoluble compound. And usually the complexation is reversible. Some previous studies have shown that uh, while the sacrodextrin can increase the solubility and uh, reduce the precipitation risk for a drug, at the same time, it could also decrease the uh, free concentration that, uh, of a drug that will be available to permit the intestinal membrane due to 
the complexation formed between drug and uh, cyclodextrin. So basically, the cyclodextrin effect on, absor on the absorption would be solubility and uh, permeability interplay. To follow that concept, it is possible that the cyclodextrin in the intraconal solution not only played its role to increase intraconal solubility, but also formed a complex with our drug, phenobutanib, when they co-administered it uh, in the DDI study. So to prove that, my colleague Matthew and Tom have proposed several in vitro and in vivo experiments. And here is the highlight of the key result. So first, from the in vitro solubility study, they found that phenobutanib can form a strong complex with the sacrodextrin and the extent of complexation is concentration dependent. So they estimated the complex read constant, which is the K complex, is quite high, um, which is two times 10 to fifth. Also from the uh, in vitro permeability assay, they found that the sacrodection can decrease the apparent permeability of phenobutanib, also in a concentration-dependent manner. So if we express the sacrodection uh, dose as a molar ratio to phenobutanib at the level that's similar to what has happened in the DDI study, we will observe nearly 16-fold decrease in the apparent permeability uh, of the phenobutanib. So to understand the in vitro to in vivo translation of this sacrodextrin effect, we also conducted a panogastrin treated dog PK study by dosing the phenobutanib with or without sacrodextrin. And uh, we see the sacrodextrin can decrease absorption and the phenobutanib. Also the effect on the absorption is dose dependent. So what I'm showing you here the figure on the right bottom. This is a, a dog study at the dose level that are containing similar amount of sacrodextrin used in the DDI study. As you can see, the Cmax decreased ninefold, and you see sevenfold. At the same time, the feces recovery increased nearly sevenfold. So collectively, this preclinical pre in vitro and uh, in vivo data provided a strong evidence that is supporting our hypothesis that phenobutanib can form a complex with our compound phenobutanib that could affect the absorption. So now we need to put the puzzle together to elucidate how this phenobutanib exhibiting complexation confounded the drug enzyme interaction in our clinical study. So for that purpose, we believe a mechanistic PPPK model can play a unique role. So now I'm going to show you how we can build a mechanistic model that to incorporate this hypothesis supported by preclinical data into human. And uh, then we can show you uh, using that model, we'd be, sim be able to simulate the complexation effect on phenobutanib PK in human, and we can deconvolute the clinical DDI data and determine this key parameter, fm 63 a and also confirm it using all other clinical data. So in this work, we use the SimSIP mechanistic atom absorption model. I believe Many of you are familiar with that or can find the information from SimSIP. So very briefly, the atom model um, divided the human GI uh, into a physiological meaningful compartment that include the stomach, uh, seven uh, small intestine segment and colon. So through the GI, it will have a segregated blood flow, a varied pH, also um, biosalt concentration, also could be a different level of the enzyme and transporter expression or activity. So this way, we'd be able to integrate the GI physiology 
parameter with the drug property together to predict the uh, reach and extent of absorption. So to incorporate the cyclodextrin effect, we came up with approach by using the mechanistic permeability model in the uh, atom absorption. So here's a little bit of details. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, each console is formulated in sacrodextrin to increase the solubility by forming this complex with the sacrodextrin. However, the excessive sacrodextrin in the upper GI could also form a tight complexation uh, complex with the phenobutanib, which which has been proved by our preclinical study. And uh, so, as you can see, the formation of this complex could lead to a reduction of the free fraction of a phenobutanib available to permit the small intestine. And the reduced or decreased effect of permeability can eventually uh, subsequently uh, reduce the absorption. So at the time this work was conducted, we're using SimSIP version 16, it do not have the feature allow us to model this entire sacrodection uh, complex process. So instead, we came up with approach to directly mimic the sacrodection phenobutanib complexing effect on the effect of permeability. So to do that, we used the uh, atom model's mechanistic effect and permeability model. And by using that, we will be able to predict the effect of permeability in each different segment of the GI instead of predict a lumped PF. So this will allow us to adjust the effect of permeability at the uh, GI, especially the upper GI, to effect to reflect or capture the effect of the complexation of phenobutanib absorption. But interestingly, later we learned that SimSIP has developed a sipping binding model in their new version of software. So we see the opportunity that we can leverage this new feature. Um, to model the sacrodection complexation and a subsequent effect more mechanistically. So about this model itself, what I mean is the excipping binding model, uh, Dave Turner from SimSIP have presented in much more details. That's the model they developed. So you can find more detail from the link uh, on the right bottom here. So here, I'm going to very briefly show you how we use that made it work for phenobutanib. So very briefly, the model allow us to correlate the effective permeability with the free phenobutanib concentration to capture this free, free fraction effect on the permeability read. And uh, with the model setting, the sacrodection concentration along the GI and its effect on phenobutanib solubility, subsequently free fraction, can be simulated. So as you can see, instead of put the sacrodection, uh, conazole, which is the drug that are formulated in sacrodection, we replace that with the phenobutanib in the substrate position and uh, the sacrodection on the inhibitor position, that's what's required by the model. By input, the dose of sacrodection and the key value, the simulation can be done. So anyway, using this two approaches, we be able to simulate the effect of sacrodection complexation on phenobutanib uh, PK. So as the shown you here, the left figure is the phenobutanib PK simulated use the PPK model with or without reduce the PF in the upper GI to reflect the complexation effect. The black PK profile is the phenobutanib PK without 
stack reduction, and the blue dotted line is with consideration of the complexation effect. So similarly, the right figure is from the simulation using the stack reduction binding model with the input stack reduction dose and the key complex determined from an in vitro study. So as you can see, when the complexation effect is incorporated in the model through either approach, the mechanism absorption model do predict a decrease of the phenobutinib absorption. And the effect is more pronounced on the Cmax than AUC. So while this is a reduction binding model, in the new version of software is more uh, mechanistic. But unfortunately, we cannot use it to, to simulate the interaction among three things, sacrodection, phenobutinib, and each chromosome simultaneously. As what I just showed you, in order to simulate the next step, DDI, with each chromosome, each chromosome and also its inhibitory metabolite both also need to be in the inhibitor position. So that was not the model initially developed for until we discovered this more complicated uh, issues or uh, phenomena. However, since we be able to use the, uh, our model with the menu re reduction of a PF to confirm the effect of sacrodection on the PK, so we continue the using the model I just described with the old version of the software for the further deconvolution of the DDI data. So what you see here is the <clears throat> simulation of DDI for the phenobutin PK in the present and absent of each chromosome. So what's shown here is uh, the left panel is if we only consider CYP3 inhibition factor from uh, each chromosome, but the no sacrodection effect, you would expect a quite a significant DDI. The red line is the phenobutinib with each chromosome, and the blue line is the phenobutinib dose alone. So you would expect to see both increase in Cmax and AUC. However, <clears throat> if we use the model we just de uh, developed by considering both CYP3 inhibition effect and also complexation effect. As you can see, the increase of the Cmax and AUC caused by CYP3 inhibition can be offset uh, by the decrease the reduction of absorption that was caused through this complexation with the sacrodection. So if we overlay this simulated with observed clinical DDI data, which is a single dose of phenobutinib after six days six day of pretreatment with each chromosome. You see that both CYP3, uh, <clears throat> when both CYP3 inhibition and the complexation effect are considered, which is represented on the right figure, these observed confounding DDI data can be well captured. So this is basically, um, shown us that uh, or proved that our hypothesis that phenobutinib sacrodection complexation is the most plausible explanation of the observed data. <clears throat> but at the same time, <clears throat> you probably also think that this observed data is a net result, right? The net change will depend on the both extent of the sacrodection effect on phenobutinib absorption, also the magnitude of intracomodal CYP3 inhibition on phenobutinib. And the extent of the latter is determined by the fm 6 3 in the phenobutinib clearance. As I mentioned at the very beginning, this is the most critical factor that we would like to determine from this solving this uh, confounding DDI data. So to increase the confidence in the determination of fm 6 3 we further conducted a two set of uh, sensitivity analysis. So the first one is a sensitive analysis on the fm 6 3 value 
from uh, 0.5 to 0.95. And uh, the phenylbutynin C-max ratio and uh, AUC ratio in the presence of each chromosome was simulated at each given FMC3A. And the simulation was conducted using the model with or without considered psychodactrin fact. So as you can see here, without incorporation of psychodactrin fact, none of the simulation at all giving FM range from 0.5 to 0.95 be able to capture both CMAX and AUC change correctly. And for example, if we just only focus on to match AUC ratio, sorry, here is the bottom is the observed data. So if we only try to match the AUC ratio without good understanding what happened uh, with the CMAX, we could think, be, uh, determine that the FM could be close to 0.6, which could be underestimate the FM, which will subsequently impact your prediction with other inhibitor, which is untested scenario. On the other hand, if we correctly incorporate the psychodextrin effect at FM 0 0.8, 0 0.85, we'll be able to capture the change of both the CMAX AUC, which is a decrease of CMAX and an increase of the AUC. So furthermore, we also conducted a sensitive analysis on the extent of psychodactrin effect with regard to the phenylbutynib FM CYP3 value and the CMAX and AUC ratio in the presence of each chromosome. So as you can see in the range of the PF reduction, which we just talked about that due to the phenylbutynib uh, effect, in the range from no effect to 100 fold, we just make that uh, as bigger as possible range, at the given um, FM, each given uh, FM 6 or 8, as you can see, both CMAX and the ratio can be closely captured only when the FM was set at 0 0.8, 0 0.85. So from the mechanistic modeling, and the sensitive analysis, we were able to determine the true FM cyp 3 a from those confounding data. However, as I mentioned, since FM is the most critical parameter that will enable us to further predict the DDI for phenobutinib at other untested scenario. So to increase our confidence, uh, we believe this value of FM determined from the PPK simulation of DDI data by considering side definite effect should be further confirmed and uh, to make sure they are consistent with the other set of uh, clinical data available. So first is uh, the human mass balance study. We get those information and the data after the DDI study. So the study from uh, uh, mass balance with the uh, phenobutinib showed that uh, phenobutinib is predominantly eliminated through the metabolic pathway with the oxidative metabolite account nearly 80% of the total clearance. Also, the in vitro phenotyping study clearly showed that C3A is the predominant enzyme that is responsible for those oxidative metabolite. So as you can see, these two pieces of data are quite consistent what, with what we determined FM 6 3 a So in addition, we find another piece of data that we can use because the phenobutinib is a CYP3 substrate. At the same time, we found it's also a time-dependent CYP3 inhibitor. So some level of autoinhibition subsequently accumulation could happen. And also the extent of this accumulation will be FM 6 3 dependent. So quickly, as you can see here, when we compare the simulated and observed phenobutin PK, which is the 200 milligram BID for 10 days. So if you see the from the first figure, if the autoinhibition is not considered, the observed clinical data will not be able to well 
described. Because based on phenobutin, if the half-life, we're not expecting the accumulation of this compound. However, if the autoinhibition is considered and using different fm 6 you can see the observed accumulation of phenobutinib can be closely captured um, at the FM 0.8 to 0.85. So overall, this integrated analysis and a totality of evidence do support that phenobutinib is likely to be a sensitive CYP3 substrate with FMA CYP3A around 0.8 or to 0.85. But from a clinical risk perspective, regard to the impact of the FM CYP3, we believe that the estimate of FM CYP3 0.8 to 0.85 likely represent a worst case DDI scenario for phenobutinib when it's co-administrated with strong CYP3 inhibitors such as Itraconazole, where we would expect to see two to five fold increase on the CMAX and AUC if there's no sacrodection effect. And using this model, we simulated the uh, DDI for phenobutinib with a moderate or mild inhibitor. As the shown in this table, you see the uh, DDI risk with the mild to moderate inhibitor will be much lower. And also, we want to show you here, as you can see, the decrease, the differences of the DDI that is simulated under the two scenarios with FM, either 0.8 or 0.6 or 0.8, this difference is much less pronounced when you uh, predict the DDI with moderate to mild inhibitor, which further de decreased uh, the risk. Uh, uh, and also increase the, our confidence in the clinical risk management. So this entire work I just uh, showed you is part of our phenobutinib model informed the drug development uh, pilot program. And uh, this is uh, the uh, MI, uh, PBPK MIDD. What we uh, applied is the first one granted uh, by FDA. So as uh, the MIDD program is looking for the novel use and uh, modeling simulation in drug development, as I'm showing here, uh, using the PPK approach with incorporation of those hypothesis-driven mechanisms, we'll be able to come up with a scientifically sound rationale to explain those unexpected clinical data. And uh, the approach we're taking allow us to convolute those clinical data and determine the key parameter, which is critical uh, for us to be able to inform concomitant medication uh, strategy or recommendation, which also allow us to uh, have the opportunity to accelerate our clinical development. So the alignment of this MIDD approach do give us increased confidence internally to use the PPK approach for other programs. Also, alignment with the agency allow us to understand and know early that how this approach could be used in our um, DDI strategy and also to inform the uh, eventually the drug labeling. And uh, our learning is that the MIDD do provide you know great learning to broader scientific community as well as the agency. As now we all became aware of the rule of a drug sipping complexation on the interpretation of the DDI with the CYP3 inhibitor. And uh, we feel that it's a great opportunity for, our to, for us to think more creatively um, about how the novel modern approach can be used to, break, to bridge gaps without conducting additional clinical study. So now I would like to share some of our thoughts for the future implementation from this work. As we know, itraconazole solution is the most frequently used inhibitor in the clinical DDI study. 
when you have a, an ME that is a CIP3 substrate. So because of that reason, we believe that the shipping drug interaction should not be overlooked. But on the other hand, I want to also point out that the magnitude of the effect well depends on the extent of complexation as well as the amount of shipping uh, in the drug formulation. So especially in our case, as earlier I pointed out, so based on all the drug information that what we collected, we do notice that the phenobutinib do form a inclusion complex with the sacrodection with, uh, with a highest K complex as the table showing here. And uh, you can read uh, more details from Dr. Dirk's paper. And also compared to other formulation, uh, in the each chromosome, solution, it do con contain, we will say unusually high, almost the highest amount of sacrodection relatively uh, to other marketed drug. But uh, nevertheless, we would suggest that understand the NME complex early, uh, at least the prior you carrying out the DDI study, may provide a assurance to avoid those confounding DDI results. That will give you opportunity to decide if you can choose different formulation or something if you cannot avoid, you can choose another workaround by, for example, to do the dose staggering of the NME with the other comat that contain the sacrodection. So by now, I hopefully have walked you through and you do learned that uh, more details that address the three questions that we uh, initially tried to look at. So I'll just read most of this. Uh, we believe that from our study, we do uncovered a important rule of this drug accepting complex effect and how that could affect the interpretation of the metabolic drug-drug interaction from the clinical study. And uh, using a mechanism model with incorporation, those drug sipping interaction, we be able to explain the confounding DDI data from the clinical study. And uh, more importantly, without conducting additional study, the mechanistic PPK model could help us to confirm those key parameter, fm 63 a for a CYP3 substrate which will ultimately allow us to use this approach to predict the untested scenario and inform the COMAT strategy. Our last but the very important message is uh, we believe this findings underscore the importance of not overlooking the possibility of drug recipient interaction. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues from the project team, uh, from uh, the uh, PPK modeling simulation working group, and uh, from the colleagues who were part of the uh, FDA's MIDD uh, pilot program, as well as our manager for their support, and uh, everyone uh, who has been involved directly or indirectly to this work from DMPK and the clinical farm. Ecology department. Thank you for your time and attention. All right, thank you so much, Yuan. And we've gotten a ton of questions from our our audience, so that's that's really great to to see. So we'll try and answer as many as uh, as we can. So someone says that studies have shown that bile salts and other luminal constituents can replace itraconazole from its complex with cyclodextrin. So changes in phenobrutinib's PK in the presence of Sporinox solution could also be linked to this mechanism. So this person wanted to know if, if uh, what you thought on the, about this idea. So uh, yeah, can you repeat it? So the thought is uh, the replacement of the bile salt. Yeah, yeah. That, that that could could that could that could phenobrutinib's PK changes in, in the presence of Sporinox be linked to the mechanism of bile salts replacing 
itraconazole from its complex with cyclodextrin? Yeah, well, at least based on, I do not have the knowledge that uh, the biosalt can replace these, uh, uh, the, the cyclodextrin for sure, to what extent. Um, so the answer is uh, we do not consider that. And uh, I believe in the SimSips sacrodection binding model, they will assume the replacement or interaction would be minimal. So uh, I don't know if this audience probably have more knowledge on that. Uh, I definitely would like to learn more on that. But in our current situation, we didn't consider that. Okay, great. Um, someone would like to know what was the formulation, I'm thinking they, they mean for itraconazole, used for your control study in dogs? Uh, I, there's an, I, I'm sure there's no sacrodection, uh, but I'm not able to tell what exactly the uh, details of the formulation. So is the question thinking there's another uh, excipient excipient interaction. Yeah, that that person may uh, maybe maybe can add some uh, clarifying uh, information so, to, the, yeah. to the question. Yeah, um, Stan, uh, am I be able to see the question? Yeah, no? it's. Uh, I'll sign it to you. Yeah, I'm very exciting. There's a uh, lots of question, uh, but I'm just try to see if. Uh, have people to see it too. So. Yeah. Um, someone mm. else said um, there's more than sixfold less absorption of fenobrutinib with cyclodextrin, but the DDI study only showed a moderate decrease in Cmax, and they wanted to know what you thought about that. So I assume the uh, this audience is connecting the data from dog to human. Uh, is that right? So. Okay. Well, so first, I guess if uh, because I cannot read that question. So uh, first, I will see uh, for the dog study, right? When we will try to uh, correlate to the in vitro in vivo correlation. We believe there's a qualitative translation from reduction of permeability to the reduction of absorption. Um, but at the same time, this IVIV extrapolation, when we bring it to, from a dog to human, we don't believe that we'll have one-to-one -one translation because the physiology different between, rat, uh, between dog and a human. Uh, but if the audience asks the human itself, uh, what we see now is a net effect. So in other words, if without the sacrodection, we will see the significant increase. Uh, but when, they, when the sacrodection impacted the absorption, so it will decrease the absorption. And uh, as a net effect, that's what you have seen. On the other hand, I think what I didn't uh, have the time to elaborate more is uh, we saw that more uh, reduction on the Cmax rather than the AUC. So I ha our hypothesis is that uh, since the excessive amount of sacrodection, mostly on the upper GI, that's where the complexation will happen and the, to impact the uh, absorption. However, since the complexation is reversible, so there you know, along the GI, uh, in the lower GI, the uh, some phenobutinib could become a free. And in the model simulation, we do see some level of increase of the absorption in the colon. So that make up of the AUC. So I hope that also provides some additional information that what this audience would like to see. Thank you. Someone, someone else wants to know, was the itraconazole PBPK model published by the IQ working group, was that model used for comparing with the observed itraconazole PK from the DDI study? 
uh, yes, yes, that's it's the model we used, uh, which is published from the IQ working group. Great. I think I think you you did answer this because you talked about dose staggering. Someone wanted, wanted to know, can the victim be dosed two hours before or four hours after itraconazole containing beta cyclodextran? Uh, yeah, that's an uh, interesting question. So uh, for this case, for example, we did uh, conduct some simulation as what uh, this audience was wondering, you know, two hours before or uh, four hours after either way. So yes, the staggering with a different time is possible. Uh, but we believe that uh, we can use the uh, empirical way of modeling simulation to give us guidance that how much time staggering would minimize that effect. Uh, but as so far, we only have those modeling data. So the answer is yes, but we do not have the experimental data to confirm the, uh, the level of the effect that will be avoided. Great. In the model, how is the amount of free cyclodextrin available for complex formation with fenibrutinib considered? Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, um, in the cyclodextrin binding model, um, the free fraction of the cyclodextrin, uh, the free drug concentration, like uh, in this case fenibrutinib, is connected with the PF through this model. And uh, also the free cyclodextrin concentration and their effect on the solubility. And subsequently, the free fraction of a phenobutinib will be modeled. And uh, to have that detail, I'll be honest, they, I do not have all those differential equation uh, be able to directly tell you to this audience. And I do suggest that uh, uh, David Turner would be the expert uh, from a SimSip could give you more insight. Someone would like to know whether you confirmed the effect of cyclodextrin on fenibrutinib absorption with retrospective in vitro studies. Uh, could you repeat the retrospective in vitro study? Do you mean yeah. in vitro or in vivo? In vitro. Um, sorry, I'm so I do not understand that because uh, in this case, I guess maybe the audience was wondering the retrospective from the in vivo study. Uh, so the only in vitro study we conducted, as I have shown uh, in the presentation, is how the sacrodection could form a complex and how that impact the permeability. So to understand their effect on absorption, we have to conduct the in vivo study. And this is only the confirmation what we have now is from preclinical, a dog study. And uh, as you see that in my presentation, their impact on the absorption of a human is the prediction. And uh, I guess the audience would be, or myself would be, wonder, could we retrospectively conduct a study uh, in vivo to confirm our prediction on the absorption fact? So um, the answer is uh, we haven't have generated that data. Excellent. Um... Someone says, thanks for the excellent presentation. I agree completely. When fenibrutinib was administered in cyclodextrin solution, do you expect changes in enterocyte free unbound gut of fenibrutinib? And this, this might be a little bit um, too specific, but uh, what free unbound gut value did you use for the fenibrutinib PBPK atom model? So um, the free drug concentration in the guts we used, we tested both either using what the model predicted 
or with assumption that it equal to the free fraction in the plasma. So um, both of these were tested, but they not be able to really mechanistically describe what had happened with the cyclodextrin. Therefore, we do not see their effect on our simulation results that can interpret what had happened. Someone asks if the cyclodextrin in Sporinex is binding to phenobrutinib to decrease the amount of free phenobrutinib, will itraconazole itself precipitate in the gut lumen, resulting in low exposure of itraconazole in the system and hence a low uh, CYP3A4 mediated inhibition? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. We have thought about that basically to replace or because they are competing. So well, first we do not believe because as you can see from one dose of uh, itraconazole, it has eight gram of cyclodextrin. And uh, so that's, it's plenty to have the uh, complexation both with itraconazole and our drug. Uh, the other piece of evidence is that if that replacement happened, we could expect to see lower extraconazole concentration. So based on our data, we do check that the extraconazole dose before or after, I mean, it's prior to co-administration with the phenobutinib or after which is co-administration with the phenobutinib, their concentration almost not change. So therefore our conclusion that we believe there's no, at least any significant replacement has happened. Someone's uh, comments, they say, very interesting presentation and application of PBBK. Most of the simulations that you showed didn't show simulated variability in PK profiles. Did you evaluate any potential variability in drug in the drug excipient interaction that you explored? For example, did you identify any demographic or patient risk factors that would mean that certain patients would be at risk for a particularly strong drug-drug interaction? Um, well, first, in this simulation, we do uh, use the population, uh, typical 10 by 10, and we did to generate those simulation data. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we didn't really assess how those uh, variability, uh, especially the risk associated with the individual. And I think that's a, a very good point, which we would like to uh, be able to do that and uh, in the future uh, by working, you know, also with the uh, SimSIP to, once we have a better, higher confidence uh, on, you know, using the model to capture the individual and uh, the overall availability. But on the other hand, I, yeah, I appreciate that question. This is a very valuable point. Uh, we would like to do more in the future. But uh, on the other hand, I just also want to uh, add in is for this uh, CMAX decrease, uh, there's people asking, you know, 11 fold is the same, it's a very minor change. You know, how that compared to, you know, the variability, is that a biological uh, reason or there's could be experimental uh, 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 error. Uh, so we actually did look at the individual data. Uh, out of 14 subjects have the full data, 12 of them has decreased or not changed. There's only two subjects have increased uh, CMAX, but they also have the lowest baseline indicating they could have higher gut metabolites, therefore their impact from itraconazole will be higher. So that will not completely offset by the uh, absorption change. So this audience question, definitely valuable things like this, uh, we would be interesting to uh, be able to build the model, look at the individual and which will help to mitigate the risk 
uh, on that point. Excellent. Someone asks, um, or they state, the cyclodextrin has been reported to modulate PGP. Will the modulation of PGP by cyclodextrin affect phenobrutinib absorption? So uh, yeah, I noticed there is star to have some uh, uh, work done to look at the cyclodextrin effect on the enzyme as well as the transporter. Um, I do notice, yeah, there's a report talking about the modulation of PGP. So well, first, uh, uh, those are very interesting research, uh, but at the moment, I, at least to my knowledge, uh, I haven't really find that how those in vitro data would translate to into the um, in vivo or clinical significant effect. Um, so in current model, as I mentioned, we only considered if the itrocomazole itself could modulate or inhibit the PGP, how that could impact the results. And the sacrodection effect was not uh, modeled. But it's good to know that there uh, some interaction could happen. But we need more work, at least I believe, to understand their meaning to in vivo in the clinic. Great. We've just got a few more questions. Was there any? Oh. Was there? Was there good agreement between the predicted and observed plasma concentration profiles for days two through four? To to what the last one is to two to four? Yeah, uh, I guess day, days two to four. I guess of of uh, repeated dosing for the itraconazole. Uh, or for the fenobrutinib. Yeah, I said it says predicted and observed plasma concentration profile. So I'm guessing fenobrutinib. Uh, yes, with the, all the data we have, uh, because for the multiple day study, sometimes they are not sampling uh, every day. So for the data we have, yes, the model can well capture the observe the data, uh, especially as I mentioned earlier. Uh, since we believe there is uh, some level of auto inhibition, uh, therefore the accumulation happen. Um, to be able to define the right FM would also impact how well we can capture that data. And then using this final model, we'd be able to capture all the observed the clinical data. Someone says, based on your research and knowledge of drug cyclodextrin binding kinetics, is it advisable to avoid using cyclodextrin in formulation DDI studies to get the worst case scenario DDI results? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> quite a big question. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's a very good question because as I mentioned, we all from industry, we know for NME as a CIP3 substrate, we will use it to commodify DDI study. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So at the at this moment, uh, I, I don't think uh, the research or data would uh, suggest a, a general approach. Uh, with the reason of that, as I mentioned, we did also conduct the literature search to try to find more uh, data uh, published if there's other people have seen this phenomenon how common this will happen, right? So our finding with Xepin will really change a lot <clears throat> when we implemented it. So to do that, we definitely like to collect more data. Uh, surprisingly, you know, there's an, a, not a lot uh, has been published. So that, that, that's the first point that before I forgot, I want to mention. And here, I think in the pharma industry, maybe we can think about some source to be able to share those data so we can know how frequent that could happen. Because as I mentioned, the extent of the binding will depend on your drug's property. And uh, those are the piece of data that has been missing. So um, from our experience, this is also the first time we have seen this confounding data with this specific drug, which also, as I mentioned, they somehow because their 
size that especially caveat to the sacrodection from this uh, tight, very tight complexation, this could be uh, something really need to step study the based on each individual compound. Um, so as I suggested in the uh, last slides, I think in the preclinical stage, if you can determine the K-complex for your NME with the sacrodection, that will help you to make a decision whether you need to avoid a sacrodection. Fantastic. It looks like we have uh, one last question, Yuan. Someone wants to know, will eight grams of cyclodextrin change the luminal fluid volume or the GI transit time? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about that. So with the eight gram of cyclodextrin, will that change the GI transit time, or yeah, the, the, or the or the fluid. luminal luminal fluid volume. Uh, be honest, I do not know that answer. I tried to connect that question with what we see. Uh, the delay of the Tmax, what we believe, is because the sacrodection forms a complex with our compound, where but because it's a, a uh, reversible, so we see the shift of the absorption. Uh, I do not know, or we didn't incorporate that to see that could delay the uh, nominal fluid or the uh, GI transit time. So it's an interesting question. I'll think more, maybe find the source or maybe exchange information with this audience. We have some more knowledge on that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Yuan. Uh, next slide, please. Before concluding the webinar, we have a few short announcements. We have upcoming webinars that you don't want to miss, and you can register for all of them by visiting us at sertara.com. On behalf of Sertara, I would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. This concludes the webinar. Goodbye and have a great day.